Betty Edwards, I have been a follower of yours for many years. Really, Susie, and, that's good to know. And you have excited me about creativity for many years. Your, your books really changed my life, you changed many things for me. Seriously, Susie, oh, that's you. wonderful to hear, thank really. Thanks for joining have you, me. Have you done art before? Have you well, I was one of these people who always thought, you know, I can't draw. At school, I was told, you can't, you know, you can't draw, forget it. So, oh. yeah, I, I had a school that didn't help me. That's terrible. That is cruel, actually. <laughs> I'd love to start off by asking you, what, what was it that got you into this in the first place? Into this whole field? Um, it, it was when I first started teaching in order to make a living, actually. And I was teaching high school and um, teaching art classes. And I thought that I would teach the kids quickly how to draw, and then we'd get on to interesting stuff. And it was, to my surprise, they couldn't learn to draw. They just couldn't learn it. And I couldn't understand. I knew they were learning other things, and I couldn't understand it. And it was really working with those high school kids that I stumbled on the uh, uh, the basis of drawing on the right side of the brain, mm -hmm. the basic techniques. And uh, Susie, everyone can learn to draw. That everyone. was one of my questions. Are, do, are, are some of us talented and some of us not talented? Uh, in the sense that some of us are talented for math, some of us are more talented for music, uh, and so on. But we all learn to read, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, learning to draw is the same thing, really. Now, uh, we're really talking about basic drawing, not doing art. Mm -hmm. Just as we're talking about basic reading, mm -hmm. not becoming a famous writer. So everyone learns to read eventually or most everyone in our country, and everyone can learn to draw. It's, it simply is not that difficult. In fact, I think reading, learning to read is much more difficult. So when- uh, it, you, you see, you look doubtful. <laughs> I just know that I have spent so many hours in class with an art teacher at the front of the thing, not being inspired and feeling awkward, you know, feeling like, yes. gosh, I'm no good at this, which is not a nice feeling to feel. Yes, well, I had the same situation with math. I had bad teachers, and because of that, I couldn't learn the basics of math and consequently i have always thought of myself as not being good at math mm -hmm. but really uh, the quality of teaching has enormous effect enormous mm -hmm. incredible and over the years we've developed a lot of understanding about how the brain works and you talk a lot about the right hand left hand differences can you explain a little what, what your experience of the differences are and how they come together? Are you right-handed, Susie? I am. Aha. Uh -huh. And are you right-eyed or left-eyed? Do you know? Um, Betty, I don't know. I've never thought of this. Uh, you close one eye and point to something in, in the room in front of you. Close one eye and point so, you, so your I'm finger... I'm right-eyed. I'm right-eyed. You're right eyed, and you're right handed and right eyed. Yes. Uh -huh. So that's the most common situation. I also am right eyed and right uh, right handed. Um, so if you are right eyed and left handed, that has a 
has some difference. We're not exactly sure what all those differences are. Um, but there is a difference in the way the two hemispheres work if they are opposite sides, right-handed and left-eyed. Um, about 64% are have that situation and about uh, uh, 34% uh, and that, that is I'll say say that again 64% are right-eyed and right-handed 35% are left-eyed and right-handed and 10% approximately are are uh, or sorry 1% are um, have uh, left eyes and right, left-handed eyes and right-handed uh, verbal uh, skills. Uh, so these differences uh, ha do have differences in personality. Um, we're not exactly sure what causes it, and we're not exact. It, it isn't cut and dried if you're left-eyed and right-handed. There is a whole range of personalities. Uh, so it, it's all being still studied, especially eyedness, which really hasn't had much uh, uh, popularization. Yeah. It's interesting how um you know, with modern science looking at the different um, scans of the brain and so on, but we still don't know that much about localization within the brain and the harmonization of the different lobes. We know that there is tendency for one way and the, another, but somehow a neuroplasticity is such an interesting concept. One of the things I, I'd love to ask you is, what does drawing give us as a skill? How does it make us improve as humans if you wish or, or what is it that that makes us want to to draw as the cavemen have <laughs> yes right right it goes back so early in humankind 30,000 40,000 years before bc actually and um humans started out drawing and drawing then uh, progressed, we say, we think progressed and changed into writing. Pictures became pictographs and then became uh, written language. And written language has really taken over uh, large parts of the brain. But children still want to learn to draw. They, they love drawing, and nearly all children do draw. Children love it, don't they? They don't need to be asked to draw. They naturally no. just go for it. No, they love doing it. And at a certain age, they want to learn how to make things look real. The school system no longer teaches drawing, unfortunately, largely because the teachers themselves cannot draw. They've come up in the same system and they cannot draw. Um, so children then begin to think around age nine or so that they have no talent. And the schools actually encourage that thought, you know, as with you, for example. And um, uh, so children then decide they have no talent for drawing and they give it up forever. Uh, but the fact is that all children can learn to draw given proper instruction, mm -hmm. just as all children can learn to read given proper instruction. Now, what is the advantage of that? Well, you engage the capabilities of the left brain with reading, with language. You engage the capabilities of the right hemisphere withdrawing and that means seeing the whole picture uh, is seeing uh, differences that aren't expressed in writing seeing uh, how things fit together this is terribly important 
and also seeing things that don't fit reality. In other words, when untruths are being stated by the left hemisphere, the left hemisphere the left hemisphere tends, if it doesn't know the answer to something, it makes up an answer, it just in order to have an answer. And the right hemisphere is able to see these things and object uh, nonverbally, frowning, shaking the head, so on. Uh, so it, language has overwhelmed our ability to see things and to see things not as we think they are, but as they really are. So that's the end game. Mm. Reading so I'm wondering, as you're saying that, then does this helps with creative thinking then? If you're, if you're processing the draw, it's going to help you see the world in different ways, in fresh ways. Exactly. Precisely. Right. To see the whole picture, and to see how the parts fit together or don't fit together. Uh, we, have, we have plenty of uh, stuff going on right now in America yes. where the parts don't fit together and people are questioning language coming from our famous leader, for example. Yes, yes, it's very interesting. It does have a big perspective. I'm interested in this big perspective of how, I'm a big fan of creativity. I've just written a book on creativity and encouraging people to get more creative and get to get more inspired and to follow this um, source of inspiration and ideas that can come to us. And yeah. allow us to see the world in a, in a different way than maybe we have been conditioned with media and newspapers and TV. exactly we need to begin to see the world differently these days exactly language rules yes it language rules yes. and uh, the right hemisphere is over there saying hey wait a minute or what about this or what about that or uh, i see things differently mm. and so on in order to uh, try to try to reach reality. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. And the right hemisphere, because it doesn't have language in a large part, is uh, it is I, I believe is forced to see reality even against its will. Mm -hmm. It can't do a number on reality. It can't make up a story about reality it has to see reality and we need that check mm -hmm. this book drawing on the right hand side of the brain has sold millions around the world um this is a fourth edition of this new york times bestseller what has changed betty since you first wrote is it are there funded because there are some fundamentals in this that are extraordinary and is to do with being a human being and is unlikely to change possibly over time. But I'm interested with technology coming in and the different world we're in and the innovation that's, that's happening, I hope, in many areas of the world to bring us into a better transformation of a, of a new kind of world. I'm wondering what has changed since you wrote this? How Would you write it differently? I do believe that that language, oddly enough, is now um, giving way to vision. Um, yeah. This is showing in written language, for example, with emojis. Yes. Uh, uh, and um, with television. Yes. And with movies and with uh, uh, especially the Internet, where where uh, vi vision is now creeping up on language 
and beginning to overwhelm it. And also in my book, I, I, I mentioned the uh, popularity of tattoos. <laughs> it's very, very odd uh, kind of putting visual symbols on one's own skin, you know. Uh, so I do believe that, not due to my book, but that my book was a symbol of this growth of visual, uh, it's visual use of vision, use of vision, and uh, visual means such as drawing and so on. So now, for example, um, if you look at the signatures of famous famous people, they're often just scribbles, you know, the signatures of our own president, for example, and many other very prominent people are just scribbles. So it looks to me that language is losing its power because of television, because of the internet, because of things like Zoom and so on. Um, and that we may be entering another time, another time. Now, images can be used in bad ways also. So we have to be careful of that. But the thing is, the right hemisphere is not able to, um, to do a, it's not able to lie. It is forced to see reality. And that's a good thing. Absolutely. I was intrigued that in the early pages um, of your most famous book, um, you said that when I was writing this, the book contained, the, when I, we went back to the book, it contained other content, another form of content, like hidden content. Can you speak about that? That's fascinating. What, what, what did you mean there? You're talking about the drawing book. Yeah. Yes. Um, the the hidden content, I think, is what I was just talking about. Ostensibly, the book is how to learn to draw. But but the hidden content was how do you tap into the right hemisphere? How do you use its capabilities? in order to better relate to reality and in order to avoid lies we have, we have to we have to recognize that the left hemisphere has great lying ability it's awfully good at it and we need to be able to recognize that right hemisphere sees it it's not and it's not judgmental in that sense uh it is that it it cannot help but see reality and that i think will be a good thing and people watching this video can you give a couple of examples of exercises that people can do to enhance that faculty well you know, I, I think it is realistic drawing, which is the start. It's not the end of art. Uh, art proceeds into abstraction and all of the ways we know art can be practiced. But the, the, the main thing about it is that it, it can relate to reality. You know, the thing that most that our students most often say when they finish a class is that they are now seeing so much more. And I say to them, well, what was it like before you learned to draw? <laughs> and they say, I think I was just naming things. So that's the difference. We see the world, actually see it, not just doing a verbal number on it. That's a tree, that's a cat, that's a house, that, and never to look at it in detail again. So we're missing so much that way. So it's like opening up 
to a larger extent, one of our main senses. Yes, exactly. And, yes. and perception and altering our, expanding and um, amplifying our perception of the world through the discipline of, of drawing. Yes. And right. I've, I've noticed in my own research around creativity what a healing process it is. Yes, well, I did. I, I, one wonders why that is. Yeah. I wondered if you had any points of view about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think that human beings have become separated from the, from the natural world. And I think that drawing brings us back into at least some relationship to how beautiful things are and how amazing they are. Um, so that it's, it's a richer world, I think. Mm -hmm. Learning to draw almost never harms anyone. You know, it, it, it is uh, always, at least we find that with our students, that it is always a plus. They feel, and express the fact that they feel that life is richer, mm -hmm. that it's more interesting and therefore more valuable. Mm -hmm. and about age, we spoke about children loving drawing. As you get older, yes. if you have never learned to draw and you're getting older, is, is, does that mean it's going to be harder for you? Or what's your experience with this? Our oldest student was 85, and uh, she had never drawn, and she learned to draw beautifully. Uh, you know, no other creature on the face of this planet draws. Yeah. It, not, we are the only ones. Yeah. So it seems to be a natural capability for human beings. Mm -hmm but we are not uh, taking advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore we're not seeing very well. Um, How would you like education to change to reflect the importance of drawing? I would like to see reading and drawing taught as twin skills. One would enrich the other. Mm -hmm. um, all children would enjoy that. They love to learn to draw. And um, uh, drawing can be incorporated into <coughs> reading and uh, learning through language. Mm -hmm. So that, say, in studying history or math or whatever, images, drawn images, can reinforce learning. And it, it, it extends memory in, enormously. I mean, I can still remember drawings I did 40 years ago right. of say, maybe it's some ordinary uh, landscape of a tree or something. And I, I can <laughs> call it up in memory. It's astounding, really. Amazing. So if we could apply that yeah. to language, which is ephemeral, you know, it disappears. Um, Betty, I would like to share um, a personal story with you, which is um, two years ago, uh, I was diagnosed with brain cancer, which I successfully recovered from. Thank you. And um, I, yeah, I found my creativity just went through the roof. I could suddenly sing and I could draw a little bit where I never had before. So here I am in my 50s, suddenly experiencing a new wave of creativity. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, and I kind of wish I'd had it come earlier, but I'm happy it's come at any time, really. It's interesting. Yeah, at any age, really, we, we have learned that, right? Uh, the ideal young age is about 10, 9 to 10. Yeah. The, uh, the ideal elderly age, I think 
it would, you know, I am 94, for example. You're 94. I am. Chicken, <laughs> okay. I am. I am always the oldest person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very funny. Uh, uh, but it, we have not found an age limit, really, for our students. Mm -hmm. You can really learn it. In, I think it's a natural human thing. And it's gotten boxed away as something that requires special talent. Sure. This should never have happened. No. Tell me, you have a new book out. Yes. Can you tell us about that? The title is Drawing on the Dominant Eye. And um, it actually started with the students that, that I, I noticed that in their drawings, they were emphasizing one eye. And we were teaching this but it was showing up in the drawings. Um, and then um, I began observing people on TV, which is very good, very um, useful. Uh, you can turn the, the sound off and, and, and uh, make a decision, which is this person left-eyed or right-eyed. Um, and so I, I did, um, I got into some research on that subject. It's fairly unknown, actually, um, and uh, became so interested in it that I decided to do a book about it. Mm -hmm. And that, so that's how it happened. Amazing. What's the time frame between your previous book and this one? Oh, try. oh, well, the first book was published in 1979, and uh, this one this year, uh, so how many ever years that is, 40 years nearly. And how was it returning to writing after, uh, writing a book after, because that's quite a pro, I mean, I'm an author myself, I know that's a huge process to write a book. <laughs> it, it, it is. It, um, um, I, 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 you know, it is in writing a book that you really learn the subject. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you've learned that as well as I have. Um, and it, I had done other books in the meantime, the book on color and, and um, so on. But uh, I, I just wanted to find out more about this. And I knew that by writing it, I would, I would better solve all of the problems of it. So I just took a flyer and then I had to stay home anyway because of the pandemic. So I thought I might as well spend this year doing a book. So this was written, and this book is rather, is, is, is uh, in some ways I think lighter, it, it's, it's more fun than the drawing book, which is pretty serious, you know. But it's serious yeah. and effective. I mean, I have read your new book. It is certainly fun. It's very accessible. I hadn't oh, read it. Was, it was yeah. written during lockdown. That's so interesting. Yes. <laughs> I think we, we, we see a lot of very interesting, and you see a lot of people leaned into their creativity during lockdown with music or dancing or writing or drawing or whatever. I think people found in the lockdown scenario that they wanted to inspire themselves somehow and turn to their creativity, which is wonderful. Yes, I agree. I agree. I also wrote a book. I finished my most recent book called The Art of Creativity during lockdown because I found myself like, oh, wow, I might as well sit there. There we were both, both spending the time that, you know, this lockdown gave us. Yes. lockdown gave us to write a book you know it's amazing and it's i think many people and i myself am reading books that i would ordinarily read and i'm hearing from my friends in the book industry and in publishers that book sales are going through the roof during yes this time. that's what penguin it's, is telling me too penguin, everyone all the big publishers are saying People are buying books, reading books, talking about books, wanting books more than ever. And how lovely is that? Isn't that a wonderful thing? 
thing. Oh, really. And now we have a, a book on, on drawing and creativity from Betty Edwards. I'm so excited. It's a wonderful book out from Penguin. When does it come out, Betty? November 10th, it will be in Amazon for sale. Great. Uh, and we, we did the book from, I worked on it from February, I think, in, in one year, which is really a record for me. Usually it's two years, maybe three years yeah. even Pretty to awesome. finish the book. But, and Penguin was great about yeah, I love yeah. Penguin as a publisher. Um, so what's your routine for writing? How, how do you get to the page? What's your routine generally? I go back a few pages, read it, read those few pages, see what needs changing. And by that time, I'm into my right brain and able to work. Uh, the worst part is uh, is just, I worked seven days a week for six months or so on this book. So it, it has to be routine for me. And I do it by saying to myself, I'm not really going to work on the book. I'm just going to read these last few pages ah, and see amazing. if there's anything that needs changing so it's really a con that's a good I'm one. always <laughs> conning myself how do you start have you do you write a plan or do you how do you do that uh, I yes in fact I, I tend to write about two or three pages for every book before I ever start Right. And uh, surprisingly for me, that's the way the book turns out. That in, in those two or three pages, <laughs> I do what, and I'm always surprised by that. Mm -hmm. But I think in some odd way, I have uh, a sense of what the whole book will be like. Yeah. Before I have to start. Yeah. yeah. Is that with, true with you also? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I, I kind of, I, I meditate a lot. I'm a big oh, fan yes. of meditation. Uh -huh. um, I work a lot with the David Lynch Foundation, who are very, they're, they're all about doing transcendental meditation to help with creativity. And um, I find meditation is really useful because in meditations, I tend to get a sense of what the book is about on a big conceptual level. Yes. And then I can tie it down into a bit of a structure before I actually start. Yes. And then I have steps to follow and I kind of know where I'm going. I like yeah. to know where I'm going with a piece of work, whatever it is, you know, uh -huh. that helps yeah. me in the flow because it's about yeah. getting in the flow, isn't it? Um, so it's really the same thing. You have a conception of the whole book mm. in the beginning, yeah. right? Right. So how many hours a day have you been writing for this book that you managed to nail very quickly? How many hours would you be doing? How many hours a day? I generally started to work about one o'clock yeah. and finished about five. Yeah. I'm no good in the morning. <laughs> uh, so it was always afternoon and sometimes yeah. working later, but never starting earlier. Yeah. That's uh, that's the time for cooking or cleaning or whatever, normal life, so to speak. And, and how does it feel? I mean, you have literally helped millions of people to learn how to open up their perception and to be able to have fun with drawing. And ha that must be, I mean, that's an amazing achievement. Well, you know, before the drawing book was published, I really wondered if anyone would ever read this thing I was working on. <laughs> and then I it was that story. I love that. But I love it. It, it, it was. It proportionately included some work about Roger Sperry and the split brain cases. Uh, so that there had been a little publicity about Sperry. Mm. 
quite a lot of publicity and he received the Nobel Prize and so on. Um, and um, so to everyone's surprise, mine the most, the book just sold immediately. And uh, the publisher you know, was struggling to, to supply copies for it. Amazing. And then it was on the bestseller list for uh, nearly a year. So um, it, it was an enormous surprise to me. I don't consider myself a writer, actually, because my field has always been art and drawing and painting and all of that. So I was, I was terribly pleased and surprised. What a great story. I love, I absolutely love hearing stories from people who have had runaway success international global esteem and then they say i never knew you know i never expected this no you never expect it right what they really like this book <laughs> buying my book that's amazing and of course this was pre i mean now you know we he you and i are talking with each other across the world i'm in ibiza in spain yes. you're in america and here we are having a chat I know, isn't it astounding though? And of course, <clears throat> when you'd first done your books, this none of this was happening. That's true. It was that all word of mouth and people hearing about it and going to your classes and, and the word spreads. I don't know how that all happened because now we have technology to, to enable yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. That is exactly true, right. Mm -hmm. um, Amazing. Betty, I want to thank you so much. I have absolutely, from the moment I saw you on the screen today, and we, 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 we had a little bit of technical thing to get to talk to each other. I was just feeling in my heart, wow, what a woman. And I am so thrilled, thrilled to have the chance to talk to you. You've had a major well, impact in my life. And that's, that's so dear of you. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I wish you all the very best with your new book. And I want to thank you on behalf of millions of people who are now drawing. Thank you for your work, you know. Well, it, it's been a pleasure, Susie. And uh, I wish you well with your new book. Is it out actually now? Yeah, it came out <clears throat> in August. It was a lockdown book also. Oh, it's already out. Oh, it, wow. it came out with uh, Orion Machette in August. Uh, mm -hmm. David Lynch kindly gave me a front cover quote, which is so nice. So that's doing its thing, you know, that's growing in its, its own way uh, wonderfully. So I'm very happy. Oh, that's wonderful news. That is great. Yeah. Well, I'll be looking at it too, Susie. And thank you so much for this interview. It's been Loads of fun. I loved it. I've loved talking to you, Betty, and I feel so inspired. I feel like starting another book and doing some drawing. That's how I feel after speaking to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Believe me, it's you. not hard to do. Thank you for showing up. Thank you. And thank goodbye. You. I really appreciate it. Much love to you. Thank you. And to you too, Susie. Goodbye. Bye now. Bye-bye. <laughs>